When the seventh trumpet was blown, the kingdom of this world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of His Christ. This presupposes the return of Christ. Instead, there is another interlude, an interlude before and now an interlude after. This gives us a vision of the conflict between God and the forces of evil. God, John saw two signs, the woman and the dragon. Chapter 12 tells us how the war in heaven beca became a war on earth. And chapter 13 continues the same theme by telling of the persecution of the saints by the dragon energized beast. Chapter 14 tells us why judgment is necessary. The gospel has been preached to every nation, but the people remain unrepentant and are now ripe for harvest. Finally, the seven angels with the seven plagues. John continues to prophesy again, and now looking at the characters in the end times. The conflict of chapter 12 occurs first on earth, verses 1 to 6, where the dragon attempts to destroy the male child of the woman. Then there will be a war in heaven, and the great dragon was thrown down to earth. Finally, on earth again, where the dragon wages war on the woman and the children. John saw two signs appearing in heaven. A sign in heaven is a picture of a reality on earth. The woman in heaven is subsequently seen persecuted on earth during the tribulation. John saw a sign in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of twelve stars. And she was with child and she cried out, being in labour and in pain to give birth. Who is this woman? There are reasons why this woman is a symbolic reference to Israel. The description of the woman with images of the sun, moon and twelve stars points to Joseph's dream in Genesis 37, 9-11, where the sun, moon and eleven stars were bowing to him. His father Jacob identified these objects to represent him, his wife and his other sons whose descendants ultimately formed the nation of Israel. Second. The woman is the mother of the male child, and we know that the nation of Israel is the source of the Messiah. Isaiah 9 6, unto us, the nation of Israel, a child is born. Then another sign appeared in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his heads were seven diadems. And his tail swept away a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. Probably a reference to the first rebellion of Satan. These stars are fallen angels who revolted with Satan at his fall. These fallen angels joined Satan in his battle against Michael, the archangel. Chapter 12, verses 7 to 9. What is this dragon like? A dragon is the fierce and terrifying beast and it is described as a great dragon, telling us the magnitude of its size and power. It is red in color, bloodthirsty, the dragon is out for blood, and it is scary. Seven heads, not sure what these represent. Seven diadems, a diadem is a crown of royalty, a given authority to rule. Ten horns, a horn is a symbol of power, the number, of, the number ten represents completeness. So here is a picture of a dragon telling us that Satan is a fearsome beast. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth, so that when she gave birth, he might devour her child. In Genesis 3.15, we have the prophecy of Satan's defeat through the seed of the woman. Satan knows the prophecies about God's plan of redemption through the seed of the woman would come from the lineage of Israel. So we find him waiting to devour the long-promised Messiah. Verse 5, And she gave birth to a son, a male child, who was to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up to God and to his throne. The male child who will rule the nations with a rod of iron can be no other than Jesus Christ, the promised Messiah. We see that in Revelation 19 verse 15. Satan tried to kill the child directly using King Herod, Matthew 2.16. The catching up of Jesus includes his flight to Egypt all the way to his ascension. Satan's other attempts to thwart 
to frustrate Jesus. Jesus' mission includes the temptation of Christ in the wilderness. Matthew chapter 4. The discouragement from Peter. Jesus began to, talk, to tell his disciples about his impending death. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid it, Lord, this shall never happen to you. But Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me, for you are not setting your mind on God's interest, but man's. Matthew 16, 21-23. And then we have the, the authorities' many attempts to arrest John, to arrest Jesus. And finally, Satan entering Judas Iscariot to betray Jesus to the chief priest and officer. Luke 22, verse 3. Then the woman fled into the wilderness, where she had a place prepared by God, so that there she would be nourished for 1,260 days. Since Satan failed to kill the baby Jesus, he would turn in anger and vengeance against the woman Israel. I will talk more about this flight when we come to verse 13. There is a war between the stars, a battle between Michael and Satan. And there was a war in heaven, Michael and his angel, waging war with the dragon. It is two created angels and their forces battling each other. It is not a battle between God and Satan. Satan is no match for God. Satan wants to be like God. And Michael's name reflects God's uniqueness. There is no one like God. Satan cannot be like God. And there was war in heaven, Michael and his angels, waging war with the dragon, and the great dragon was thrown down to the earth. Today Satan still has access to heaven, and he functions as accuser of believers. But he will be cast out of heaven permanently, probably toward the middle of the tribulation. This conclusion is consistent with Revelation 13, where he will empower the Antichrist, who will in turn rule for 42 months the second half of the tribulation. And he, the dragon, was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. And the great dragon was thrown down, the serpent of old, the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world, the accuser of our brethren. The great dragon is clearly identified as Satan. Verse 9. Satan means adversary. He is an adversary in opposition to God. And here we find the many names of Satan. The serpent of old reminds us of the fall of man in the Garden of Eden and draws our attention to Satan's crafty and deceiving character. Devil. Greek diabolos. It means slandering, slandering God and accusing believers falsely. He is also called the accuser of a brethren in verse 10. He is a deceiver. He deceives the whole world to one of several ways. Lying against the truth, denying the truth, imitating the truth, or perverting in, or distorting the truth. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren has been thrown down, he who accuses, accuses them before our God day and night. A loud voice, probably from the martyr saints in heaven, because he identified the accused as our brethren. The impending or coming salvation refers not to salvation from the guilt of sin, but to salvation in the sense of deliverance from Satan's domain by the establishment of Christ's kingdom on earth. And they overcame him. They overcame the powerful red dragon. The reference there is to our brethren, the accused ones of chapter 12 verse 10 who overcame the powerful red dragon. How do they, so much weaker than Michael and the angels, manage to overcome the powerful red dragon? And they overcame him because of the blood of the Lamb and because of the word of the testimony, and they did not love their life, 
even when faced with death. The tribulation saints overcame Satan by the blood of the Lamb, by their actions, and by their attitude. How can you become an overcomer? The blood of the Lamb. Satan was defeated at the cross. Those who believe in Christ are transferred out of the domain of Satan into the spiritual kingdom of Christ. You overcome Satan by believing in Jesus as your Savior, that He died for your sins. And by confessing your sins, acknowledging that you are guilty but forgiven. By your actions, that is living the Spirit-filled life and by preaching the Word, both our life and by our lips. The Word of the Saints' testimony, the that is the preaching of the Gospel, opposes the deceiving lies of Satan. By living a blameless life, Satan's accusation cannot stick because they are not true. Thirdly, by attitude. The saints' dedication to their task, in which many of them die as martyrs, is recognized by the statement they did not love their lives even when faced with death. Love not their lives include not loving their reputation, their status and possessions. They are totally committed to Christ. Those who believe in Jesus will come out of the tribulation victorious, whether by life or death. The victory in heaven leads to the bittersweet words of chapter 12, verse 12. Rejoice, O heavens, but woe to the earth and the sea, because the devil has come down to you, having great wrath, knowing that he has only a short time. Only 1,260 days before Jesus Christ returns to earth and binds him. The dragon persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. But the two wings of the great eagle were given to the woman so that she could fly into the wilderness to her place, where she was nourished for a time and times and half a time from the presence of the serpent. We will consider each of these. The two wings of the great eagle, the wilderness, a time and times and half a time. What do they mean? Wings of an eagle. Hal Lindsay, an evangelist and author, suggested this deliverance could be could refer to a massive airlift out of the country. Since the eagle is the national symbol of the United States, it is possible that the airlift will be made available by aircraft from the US 6th Fleet in the Mediterranean. But I think it is more likely that this is a metaphor describing God's miraculous deliverance. God bore the the Israelites on eagle's wing when he delivered them out of Egypt. Exodus 19.4 You yourself have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I carried you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. Then the woman fled into the wilderness where she had a place prepared by God so that, sh that she would be nourished for 1,260 days. Where is this wilderness? Some of you may recognize this picture from the movie Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. This is El Kasneh, a ruin in the ancient city of Petra in Jordan. Petra is located in a basin with Mount Seir or Edom. It is totally surrounded by mountains and cliffs. The only way in and out of the city is through a narrow passageway that extends for about a mile and can only be negotiated by foot or by horseback. This means that the city is easy to defend. Some believe that the wilderness refers to Petra in Edom. Daniel 11.41 says, He, referring to the Antichrist, will also enter the beautiful land, that is, Palestine, and many countries will fall, but this will be rescued out of his hand, Edom, Moab, and the foremost of the sons of Ammon. Daniel 11.41 states that the land of Edom will be delivered from the Antichrist's hand. Moreover, it is also logical for the Jews to flee to, the, to this place which is outside of the Antichrist domain. In the 1920s, a man in the US known as W.E. Blackstone was so certain that Petra would be the secret hideout of Jews escaping from the Battle of Armageddon that he invested $8,000 or about $100,000 today to place boxes of Bibles in all of the caves in Petra. 
so that the Jews would have something, some interesting things to read when they were hiding from the ravages of war. The woman will be nourished for 1,260 days. Now, we're going to read from chapter 13, verse 17, that no one will be able to buy or sell without the mark of the beast during the reign of the Antichrist. So perhaps God will nourish these Israelites in a miraculous manner for 1,260 days, just as he provided the nation of Israel with manna and quails for 40 years in the wilderness. What is time, times, and half a time? A time is one year, times, plural, two years, half a time, half a year, total, three and a half years. And three and a half years is 42 months. Now, the Jewish calendar is a lunar calendar. That's the reason why the Jewish feasts move around the calendar. One month is 30 days, and 42 months is 1,260 days. So if you compare that the woman was nourished for 1,260 days in chapter 12, verse 6, and in verse 14, it mentioned the same period, time times half a time, which is three and a half years. In chapter 12, verse 5, Satan failed to kill the baby Jesus. He would turn in anger and vengeance against the woman Israel. And in chapter 12, verse 6, the woman fled into the wilderness. You might think that this flight of the woman takes place immediately after the birth of the male child. Note that the dragon persecuted the woman after he was thrown down to earth. Chapter 12 verse 13 talks about this flight into the wilderness where the woman was nourished for a time and times and half a time. And chapter 12 verse 6 says that she would be nourished for 1,260 days. This flight into the wilderness takes place in the last half of the tribulation where the woman will be under great persecution for 1,260 days or three and a half years. So there is an interval between uh, chapter 12 verse 5 and chapter 12 verse 6, an interval consi consisting of the church age and the first half of the tribulation. And the serpent poured water like a river out of his mouth, after the woman, so that it might cause her to be swept away with the flood. But the earth opened its mouth and drank up all, drank up the river which the dragon poured out of its mouth. Water like a river. This could be a literal flood of water to drown the fleeing Israelites. Or it could be a pursuit of an army of soldiers like a river. The opening up of the earth would not be something new. Korah, a Levite and his co-conspirators rebelled against Moses and Aaron in number 16. They sought the priesthood for themselves and were swallowed up by the opening of the earth. Whatever it is, the image emphasizes God's providential protection for his people during the tribulation. This doesn't mean that they are spared the wrath of Satan. Rather, it means those who believe in Jesus will emerge victorious, whether by life or death. So the dragon was enraged with the woman and went off to make war with the rest of her children, who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. Who are the rest of her children? Some have suggested that this refers to Jews living in other parts of the world, that is, outside of the land of Israel. But this assumes that all Jews in Israel fled, which I think is unlikely. The rest probably refers to both Jewish and Gentile believers. First of all, to Jews who did not flee, cannot or fail to flee, including the 144,000 who need not flee since they are protected by the seal on their foreheads. And they also include Gentile believers who are spiritual children of Abraham, according to Galatians 3. A memory aid as to the contents of chapter 12, number 12, 12 tribes of Israel, the woman Israel. Then think of her enemy, the dragon. These are the two signs in heaven that John saw, the woman and the dragon. For chapter 13, the number 13 is a supposed unlucky number. Think of evil, evil beasts from the sea and from the land. The dragon is a three times loser. He failed to destroy the male child in verses 1 to 6. He lost the war in heaven, 
and is unable to destroy the woman. Thus his wrath now is directed toward the rest of the woman's children. What Satan wants to do is to persecute the rest of the woman's children, rise to greater prominence and power. But how? How can this be achieved? Spirit doesn't have flesh and bones. He is a spirit, and as such, he is limited as to how he can function in the world. All his demons, along with himself, move in and out of people to do their evil work on earth. In Luke chapter 22, verse 3, Satan entered Judas Iscariot, and he went away and discussed with the chief priests and officers how he might betray Jesus to them. And the dragon stood on the sand of the seashore. Then I saw a beast coming up out of the sea. The angry dragon looks out over the sea. The sea is a picture of the Gentile world powers which he dominates. And he saw. And John sees what the dragon sees, a beast coming out of the sea. The fact that the beast rises out of the sea is taken by many to indicate that he is a Gentile, since he comes from the great mass of humanity of peoples, nations, and tongues. Chapter 17, verse 15. Others take the sea as a reference to the Mediterranean Sea, namely, namely that the beast will arise from the Mediterranean sea area. Probably both are true, in that the beast is a Gentile and does come from the Mediterranean Sea. Then I saw a beast coming up out of the sea like a leopard, and his feet were like those of a bear, and his mouth like that of a lion. John presents this beast from the sea as having the characteristic of the first three empires of the past. Leopard, speed of the Greek empire. Bear, strength of the Medo Persian empire. And lion, fierceness of the Babylonian empire. Then I saw a beast coming up out of the sea, having seven heads with blasphemous names. The blasphemous names on his heads reflect the beast's opposition to God. And he, the beast, opened his mouth in blasphemies against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle, that is, those who dwell in heaven. The beast spew or poured out blasphemies against God's name, slandering God's character. Against God's tabernacle, not the physical tabernacle, but those who are in heaven. And when the dragon saw the beast from the sea, he immediately knows he is my man, a man after my own heart. When Satan offered the kingdoms of this world to Christ, his offer was rejected. But now, this offer is accepted by the beast from the sea. And the dragon gave him his power and his throne and great authority. Question. Do you think the people then know that Satan is the source of the beast's power and authority? Receiving an apparently mortal blow to one of his head, the beast recovers. It seems to be a miracle. In fact, it is a parody, an imitation of the resurrection of Jesus. His fatal wound was healed, and the whole earth was amazed and followed after the beast. They worshipped the dragon because he gave his authority to the beast, and they worshipped the beast, saying, who, who is like the beast, and who is able to wage war with him? The world is amazed and responds with praise and worship directed to both the dragon and his protege, that is, the beast of the sea. Satan will be openly be the god of this age. Demonism will be rampant and openly visible. God will be ridiculed in a new regime. Blasphemies against God will be commonplace. In this worship of the dragon and his beast, two things will be acknowledged by the people of the world. The uniqueness of the beast who is like the beast, and his power, who is able to make war with him? The answer seems to be no one, not even the two witnesses. 
We are told in Revelation 11.7 that the beast from the abyss killed the two witnesses. It is likely that the beast from the abyss is the same beast from the sea. But why depict the beast as coming up out of the beast? The abyss is the abode of the dead, Romans 10.7. Coming up out of the abyss may point to the beast revival after its mortal wound was healed. Now the following is my conjecture or my guess. The beast from the sea was mortally wounded on one of, on one of his head with a sword and on his deathbed he accepted Satan's offer of the kingdoms of the world. Revived by Satan, he is depicted or described as coming up out of the abyss, fought and killed the two witnesses, received admiration and worship from the world and he set up his one world government. So I believe that the beast coming out of the abyss is the same beast from the sea. By the way, I also believe that the fallen, the fallen angel who was given the key to the bottom, bottomless pit is the king of the locusts. He is the angel from the bottomless pit. His name, both in Hebrew and Greek, which means destroyer, is the dragon, Satan himself. Authority to act for 42 months was given to him, that is the beast from the sea. It was also given to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And authority over every tribe and people and tongue and nation was given to him. In the will of God, many believers in Christ, among both Jews and Gentiles, perish as martyrs during this awful time of trial. They are persecuted, starved and killed and even beheaded. Christ rose from the dead and the world refused to believe. But when Satan's antichrist recovers from his mortal wound, the whole world is amazed and worship him. The beast is idolized and he takes that advantage to rule. Authority over every tribe and people and tongue and nation was given to him. He became a world ruler. This could be a regional superpower as the beast in the book of Daniel were all regional kingdoms. Four times it is stated that things are given to the beast. 13.5 There was given to him a mouth speaking arrogant words and blasphemies. An authority to act for 42 months was given to him. 13 verse 7 It was also given to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them and authority over every tribe and people and tongue and nation was given to him. It becomes clear that Satan and the beast cannot do a single thing without permission from God. The beast only has authority to act for 42 months. This is a powerful reminder that God limits the extent of e evil. We must always remember to trust in God's power. All who dwell on the earth will worship him. Everyone whose name has not been written from the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb who has been slain. All who are not saved will worship the beast and all those who are saved will not worship him. The phrase from the foundation of the world describes the unsaved. Their names are not written in the book of life from the beginning, from the foundation of the world. In the King James Version, the phrase describes the lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world. It is, remembered, it is important to remember that it is not a physical monstrous beast that the people are worshipping. He is a human being, possessing charm and charisma, who put together an immense international economic and political coalition, all under the direct control of Satan. If anyone has a ear, let him hear. All that has been prophesied thus far is important and every man should give attention. The scriptures goes on to say, if anyone is destined for captivity, to captivity he goes. If anyone kills with the sword, with the sword he must be killed. Here is the perseverance and the faith of the saints. 
If anyone kills with the sword, with the sword he must be killed. This is an assurance of divine retribution. God will execute justice for them, and they should not turn to violence to vindicate themselves. There is an alternate translation in the NIV and the ESV. Reading from the NIV, If anyone is to go into captivity, into captivity they will go. If anyone is to be killed with the sword, with the sword they will be killed. This is a call for submission to God's will, or God's destiny for them, and be obedient to God to be faithful even unto death. There are no accidents. What God has destined to happen will happen. This is God's sovereignty. The Bible teaches destiny, destiny, but not fatalism. Christians should not believe, que sera, sera, whatever will be, will be, leading to acceptance and inaction. When Caleb, my grandson, was in his mother's womb, scans and amniocentesis tests all point to Edwards syndrome, a very severe case. I pleaded with God to heal Caleb. Someone quoted Hebrews 11.1 1 to me. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen, saying that I must have the conviction that it will be so. Do I have the assurance that Caleb will be healed? No. I did not have an assurance from God, but that did not stop me from going to God and pleading with Him to heal Caleb. I know He can. My faith or our faith is not in faith, but in the almighty and loving God. Yes, God is sovereign, but faith in God is not passive, it is active. Many of us want to be encouraging to our brothers and sisters going through difficult times, but be careful, be careful not to give false hope. Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spoke as a dragon. And he makes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast. It is possible to render the term earth as land, and that often refers to the land of Palestine. If he came from Palestine, then he is likely to be welcomed as a prophet. He appeared to be gentle and harmless, but he spoke as a dragon. He is also known as the false prophet in chapter 19, verse 20. He performs great signs so that he even makes fire come down out of heaven to the earth in the presence of men. Which Old Testament prophet called fire down from heaven? Elijah. When Elijah called down fire from heaven, that convinced the people of the northern kingdom of Israel that the Lord is God and not Baal. The Jews expect the return of the prophet Elijah. Malachi 4.5 Behold, I am going to send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. And what is the role of Elijah when he returns? Isaiah 43 A voice is calling, Clear the way for the Lord in the wilderness. Make smooth in the desert a highway for our God. Elijah is to point to the Messiah. Now if the people believe that the beast from the land is Elijah, then they will believe that he would point to the Messiah. And who would the beast from the land be pointing to? The beast from the sea, the Antichrist. And he deceives those who dwell on the earth because of the signs which it was given him to perform in the presence of the beast. The second beast performs these miracles in the presence and authority of the first beast. The purpose of these signs is to authenticate the authority of the first beast. Not all miracles are of God. No discerning Christian trusts any and every miracle. He or she must ask the question, is this miracle demonic or divine? Let us never lose sight of the fact that false teachers, prophets and false Christ can perform miracles. The test of a true prophet is not just his ability to perform great wonders, 
but his fidelity, his faithfulness and truthfulness to the revealed word of God. Deuteronomy 13 verse 1 to 3. The second beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who had the wound of the sword and has come to life. This image becomes the center of the false worship of the beast. When God raises the two witnesses from the dead and takes them to heaven in chapter 11, the false prophet probably answered that challenge, saying, I can give life too. And it was given to him to give breath to the image of the beast, so that the image of the beast would even speak and cause as many as do not worship the image of the beast to be killed. Not only will the image move, but it will speak. It will probably take more than anima animatronics, lifelike robots, and artificial intelligence to deceive the world. Note that it is the image which causes non-worshippers to be killed. The New Living Translation rendered uh, verse 15 in this way. He was then permitted to give life to this statue so that it could speak. Then the statue of the beast commanded that anyone refusing to worship it must die. It is a decree to kill non-worshippers of the beast. Not that all believers would be killed because some believers obviously survived the tribulation. Issuing a decree is not the same as its execution. And he causes all to be given a mark on their right hand or on their forehead. And he provides that no one will be able to buy or to sell except the one who has the mark, either the name of the beast or the number of his name, 666. To enforce the worship of the beast, the false prophet forces all men of every class of society to receive the mark of the beast on their right hand or on their forehead. Those without the mark cannot buy or sell, thus making life impossible without the mark. To receive the mark of the beast is tantamount to the worship of the beast. Anyone who accepts the mark of the beast will receive God's wrath and judgment. No one will be able to buy or to sell except the one who has the mark. The medium of exchange or payment has evolved since the days of bartering. First we have coins, then paper currency, plastic or credit cards, and then digital. And now we have the mark of the beast. The mark of the beast is not far-fetched. The locations of the mark of the beast on the right hand or forehead are conspicuous, highly visible. Or else how do people know whether another can buy or sell? Chapter 13 verse 17 says that if you don't have the mark of the beast, you won't be able to buy or to sell. You can't get any supplies. You can't get any resources. You can't get any food. There will be enormous pressure to be marked. It is another device to force all people to worship the beast. How are they going to survive, those without the mark of the beast? What are they going to eat? Remember, this is a period of wars, scarcity and famine. The earth is devastated by fire. One third of the trees and all grass will be, have been burned up. The sea became blood. One third of sea creatures have died. Rivers and spring, one third have become bitter. The Lord's Prayer will be pregnant with meanings during your tribulation. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth. It is a desire for Christ's rule on earth, for God's will to be done on earth instead of the beast. Give us this day our daily bread. It will be incredibly difficult to put food on the table. The famine of the third horseman, the devastation of the trumpet judgments on the earth, sea and vegetation. You cannot buy or sell without the mark of the beast. Lead us not into temptation. Tests and trials are rampant during the tribulation. And how not to curse but to trust God. Not to give in to the worship of the beast and not to take vengeance into their very own hands. What is the mark of the beast? It is either the name of the beast or the number of his name. The next verse, verse 18, goes on to say, Here is wisdom. Let him who has understand calculate the number of the beasts, 
for the number is that of a man, and his number is 666. Why all the speculation of the number 666? Bible students have taken the verb calculate to refer to the ancient practice of gametria, an alphanumeric code of assigning a numerical value to a word based on its letters. Ancient languages, including Hebrew, Greek, and Latin, use letters from the alphabet as numerical values. For example, alpha in Greek stands for the number 1, beta the number 2, iota for 10, iota alpha then for 11, and iota beta for 12. Now, using the letters of Nero's name in Hebrew and their numerical values, students came up with the number 666. There have been many other suggestions as to the identity of the Antichrist, Judas Iscariot, Kennedy, Kissinger, Clinton, and Saddam Hussein. One expert observed that Ronald Reagan's full name, Ronald Wilson Reagan, has six letters in each name, 666. Still others pointed to Mikhail Gorbachev, the president of the then Soviet Union, who had a rather prominent birthmark on his forehead. The number of the beast is the number of a man. John is telling us the beast is a man. He is not God. Do not worship him. Seven is the number for perfection. 666 is the number of a man, not of God. It is short of perfection of the triune God. The mark of the beast is an imitation of the seal on the foreheads of the 144,000. What is the seal on the foreheads of the 144,000? The 144,000 have the name of the Lamb and the name of the Father written on their foreheads. Chapter 14, verse 1. John is in fact saying, if you take the number of the beast on your right hand or on your forehead, you will have the number of a man, not of God. They are all imitations. The dragon and the two beasts mentioned in chapter 12 and 13 are a counterfeit of the divine trinity. The dragon seeks worship that belongs only to God. The first beast, the beast out of the sea and later out of the abyss, seeks to rule the world which is Jesus Christ's prerogative, his birthright, his entitlement. The second beast out of the land glorifies the first beast which is a counterfeit of the Holy Spirit ministry of glorifying Christ. The second beast is called the false prophet in chapter 19, verse 20. These are the characters in the end times. A woman with a crown of 12 stars on her head. A male child who is to rule all the nations. Michael, the archangel, waging war with the dragon. Satan, the great dragon who was thrown down to earth the rest of the woman's children who were persecuted, the beast from the sea whose mortal wound was healed, beast from the earth who makes all to worship the first beast. In John first run through the tribulation period, he prophesies about the seal and trumpet judgments. Before the trumpet judgments began, John saw a vision of the 144,000 Jews being sealed and a countless multitude coming out of the tribulation. The first four trumpet judgments are inflicted directly, directly on nature. The fifth trumpet is the judgment of the locusts on those without the seal of God, and this judgment lasted five months. The sixth trumpet is the invasion of the 200 million, which caused the death of one third of the world's population. Then the final trumpet, which will usher in the kingdom of Christ. John was told to prophesy again this time focusing on peoples, nations, thugs, and kings. So John now has a second run through the same period, prophesying from a different angle and focusing on the various players, characters of the tribulation. To confirm the covenant with the Antichrist, what does Israel have to give up? What do they have to do? We are not told. In negotiation, you always have to give up one thing for another thing. The temple is being rebuilt, sacrifices reinstituted, and this may prompt many Jews to conclude that all's good with God. 
Yet John saw two witnesses come on the scene, wearing sackcloth, proclaiming coming judgment and the need for repentance. Something in Israel is not right. Something is wrong. What is it? What is it? There are two probabilities. There is an external conformity to all the sacrifices without inward realities. Or it could be still that the Jews are still not recognizing Jesus as the Messiah. Then John saw a battle in heaven, how this battle in heaven became a battle on earth. Satan was cast to earth and then he started persecuting the woman and we, we saw a vision of the flight of the woman from the dragon. And we are told that the Satan we are told that Satan will energize the beasts from the sea and the beast will rule for 42 months. Under the rule of the beast, John saw the countless multitude persecuted, starved and killed. Starved because they do not have the mark of the beast and they cannot buy or sell. Killed if they do not worship the image of the beast. And then we we have the trampling of Jerusalem by the Gentiles. Application Questions Today Satan, Satan still has access to heaven, where he functions as the accuser of believers. What areas of your life may give him a foothold? What sinful tendency have you not brought to the light, acknowledged and repented of? What consequences are you facing because of unconfessed sins? For the eyes of the Lord move to and fro throughout the earth, that he may strongly support those whose heart is completely his. God is ready to support, strengthen and empower you. Will you be one of those whom God is looking for? We ask God to bless us, but are we the kind of people whom he can bless? As believers, we forget that God has attached conditions to blessing. The Lord say in Zechariah 1.3, Return to me, declares the Lord of hosts, that I may return to you.